Hi everybody. In an earlier video, you learned about easing functions and how they work in CSS. Now, that video was a little on the dry side. It was very unsatisfying in that it talked about the mechanics of easing functions, but didn't really talk about what they are or how they actually work, or even what each of the built-in easing functions in CSS do. In this video, we're gonna fix that. So, let's get started. So the first thing we're gonna do is learn how to read what is known as an easing function curve. Now, you may not know what easing function curve is, but you've probably seen it all the time whenever you're looking at animations and easing functions. There are those lines that seem to indicate what rate your properties are gonna be changing in. And some of these are very familiar to you, like this is a linear one. Your properties change at a constant rate. The second one talks about acceleration. You start off slow, then you speed up very quickly. The third one's a deceleration. And the fourth one's a combination of both. Now, what I wanna do though, is try to formalize a little bit about the high level descriptions that I just use to describe these curves. If anything, it just makes you better prepared to communicate easing function curves in a more intelligent and educated way, which is always a good thing. So to visualize an easing function, let's talk about each of the axes first. The horizontal axis describes the percentage of your animation that is currently complete. At 0%, you have your animation has barely even started, hasn't started at all actually. And at 100%, your animation has completed, the amount of time that has elapsed is the duration your transition or animation originally had. Now, the vertical axis is a little bit more confusing to explain. What it describes is the progress your property is making towards going from point A to point B as part of running through its animation. So there's an equation, don't worry if it doesn't make any sense because I'm gonna use a simple example that will kind of explain how all these things fit in. And you can come back and see how it matches with the equation I have here uh, you know, later when you're really bored. Okay, so let's look at a simple example. The example I have is this. I have an element and I'm gonna fade that element out over a period of two seconds. What that means more specifically is that I have the opacity property that I'm going to be reducing from one to zero over a period of two seconds. And just to keep things simple, I'm gonna use an easing function, and that easing function is going to be linear. So let's take a look at how to map the graphs you saw earlier with the example and numbers you see right here. So let's start with the very beginning. At the very beginning, my property hasn't changed at 0%. My animation hasn't done anything either. The elapsed time is zero. The amount of my animation that has been completed is also zero, and the opacity property is still at its initial value, which is one. This is pretty straightforward. Now. The other straightforward part is what happens at the very end. At the end, after my animation has fully run to completion, you know the opacity is going to be zero and the amount of time elapsed will be the value for duration. And that is two seconds. The interesting things happen in the middle between the beginning and the end. So for example, what I've done here is, let's just say that 30% point when my animation has completed 30% of its life, the elapsed time is 0.6 seconds. 0.3 times 2 seconds, 0.6 seconds, and the opacity is 0.7. It has reduced from 1 initially to at 0.7 right now. And as you keep going further, let's say when your animation is about 70% complete or 1.4 seconds of it have elapsed, your, your opacity is going to be 0.3. And if you were to just slide this up and down this, this line, you'll see the values adjusting appropriately. But ultimately, when you at the very beginning, it is a 0 for the opacity. It's going to be 1. And at the very end, your opacity will be zero and your lapse time will be two seconds. And everything in between is defined by the particular equation that is used to define this particular easing function. And the thing to note is that I stuck with linear because it's very easy to look at without actually getting into the actual mathematics of what defines that easing function. But different easing functions, depending on what you're working with, will have different values. So in this case, I have an acceleration and in that one, it's not a perfect linear mapping between what you seek for the completion and what your property actually represents. I've made these numbers up, but it's an example of what could be possible in a curve like this, where when 70% of your animation has completed, your property might only have completed its progression from point A to point B at only 45%. So with that, I think it's time to get to the more interesting things, which is looking at what all the easing functions do, what they look like, and how to actually use them in CSS. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump into my examples and talk about each one individually. So here we have two circles, circle A and circle B. 
and right now they're both moving at the exact same rate. And that is because right now, if you look at our CSS, where I define the animation for circle A and circle B, they both have a timing function set of linear. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through every single one of the easing functions you saw in the previous slide and alter the easing function for one of them. So you'll see circle A always being linear and circle B will vary depending on which part of the slides we currently are. And that'll give you a good comparison of how each easing function ends up altering how your circles actually move. The first easing function we're going to look at is ease. This is a good one because it's a default one that gets used if you never specify an easing function as part of your transition or animation. And this one is pretty simple. It's a rapid acceleration and a rapid deceleration with a small point of just moving at a normal speed. Let's go and take a look at what it does. So I have both the, and I'm back to my example. And I'm going to go ahead and change the easing function used for circle B to be ease. And I'm going to go ahead and save. And notice now what happens is that while both A and B start and end at the same point, in between you'll see that B speeds up and slows down very quickly as it goes from point A to point B. So that's your ease easing function. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one, ease in. Ease in is your standard acceleration. You start off slow and then you move really quickly. And this one, if I were to visualize it, looks like this. Let me change the ease to an ease in. And you'll see that it gradually accelerates as it goes from each side to the other side. So pretty straightforward. And the opposite side of it is, of course, the ease out. This is a, a deceleration. You start fast and you slow down as you approach the end. And just to be consistent with this one, let's go ahead and take a look at this. Ease out. You'd see now that you speed up and you suddenly slow down. Deceleration. And if you convert your linear one, you kind of see that it definitely is a much more interesting one than just having it move at a constant rate. All of your easing functions, except for linear, are more interesting in that regard. Something I touched upon in the introduction to easing functions in the earlier video, where I talked about how lively your animations are when you're using an easing function that more closely mimics what isn't a linear movement. All right, let's go ahead and look at ease in out. So ease in out looks a little bit like your ease easing function. You're, you're accelerating and then you are decelerating. And the difference between this and ease is that this is a little bit more mild, it's more mellow. It doesn't quite rapidly accelerate or rapidly decelerate like ease does. And we'll take a look at it. In fact, I'll actually show you both how ease versus ease in work, ease in and ease out work. So ease in, ease out is the easing function right now. And you'll see that it accelerates and decelerates like we described. Let's go and compare it to the ease easing function as well. I'm gonna go ahead and modify the timing function for circle A by specifying ease. And now you'll get to see that ease A is a more aggressive acceleration deceleration. Circle B, the ease in out easing function is a more mild, more casual, you know, A is CD driver, B is driver on a nice country road or the suburbs, at least where I live. Your mileage may vary. All right, now let's go to the next one, linear. Now this is the boring one. We've seen it so many times already. And you know, I'm not going to go to the example for it because you've seen linear already. It's the default one that circle A had up until the last example where it's comparing ease in out with ease. And like I mentioned right here, unless you're really wanting something that is very mechanical and not lifelike, you should not use linear at all. Just don't use it. Step function. Now here we're getting to some very interesting specialized ones. The step function is not a smooth animation in a traditional sense. What it allows you to do is create a various of hard, finite jumps between your animation going from point A to point B. And it's a function, you have to actually specify some arguments. And the two arguments you specify are the number of steps and the value of start or end to specify where the first step occurs at the very beginning or whether it occurs at the very end. And we'll take a look at that right now. I'm gonna go back to my example. Let me change ease back to linear. So I'm gonna define the steps function. So I'm gonna type in the word steps. I'm gonna specify two arguments. The first one is the number of steps that I want this particular animation to take. Let me pick an arbitrary number like four. And then the next argument is gonna be at the start or end to determine whether the step occurs at the beginning or the end of the animation. Just to keep things simple, I'm just gonna say start. And let's take a look at what this looks like. So with a step value of four, notice how the animation for circle B moves. 
it's no longer smooth like you saw earlier. It is taking four distinct jumps as part of going from point A to point B, which is to the one side of the screen, to the other side of the screen. And the number of steps determines how many jumps you're going to be seeing. And ideally, the fewer steps you provide, the more jumpy your animation will look like. And the more steps you provide, the smoother your animation will be. So just to look at how blocky a small number looks like, let me set a value of one. When you set a value of one, you exactly have one step, which in this case is it either starts at the left or it ends at the end, but there are no intermediate states at all. This is a slightly larger number. We used four earlier. Let me use the number 10 and hit save. Notice now that your circle B is moving a little more smoothly because there are now 10 individual points it can look forward to hitting as opposed to just four as earlier or one that you saw immediately a few moments ago. Let's put a much larger number, let's say 100. When I say 100, now your animation is a little bit more smooth and I don't know if the video is capturing this properly, but there's still a little bit of jumpiness to it. And using a very large value for steps, let's say 1000, you get something that is almost as smooth as what you have with any of the other easing functions you saw. But really though, you don't want to use the steps easing function for creating smooth animation. If you really want that, use something like ease or linear or even any of the ease variations. But if you want something that is more mechanical or just going from a finite state from one to another, definitely use steps. I think it's a great one on various cases and not necessarily the best one to represent a circle moving from one end of the screen to another, but there are other valid use cases that you will find throughout the internet. Okay, we now get to the most complicated, but also the most fun easing functions of all. And that is the cubic Bezier easing function. And what this easing function does is just like steps, it allows you to specify some arguments. And these arguments allow you to pretty much recreate every single easing function you saw earlier. And just to not bore you too much, but the way this works is this. You have to define four points, and these four points end up defining the curve that you end up seeing that defines your easing function. And I'm not gonna go into detail about the mathematics behind this, but you should definitely take a look if you really wanna understand the internals of how an easing function works You know, later. Uh, I'm not gonna spend time in this video doing it. Instead, what we're gonna do is actually specify some easing functions that are using cubic Bezier and look at some tricks on how to do it in a more sane way, as you'll see in a second. Let's look at the insane way first. The insane way is to specify the cubic Bezier function and just make up some numbers. So I'm gonna type in cubic dash Bezier and you can see from the autocomplete itself, it you know, kind of indicates to me there'll be four different numbers I wanna specify. And these numbers have to be between zero and one. So I'm gonna specify a value of 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0.7. Like I said, I have no idea what I'm typing here, guys. I'm typing in random numbers. I'm gonna go ahead and save. And once I've done that, notice that there's a slight variation in how circle B moves in relation to circle A. There is a slight ease applied. I don't know what this ease is called. This could be a custom ease that I might have defined right now just by specifying four arbitrary points. So this is the more insane wrong way of doing this. Let's look at a better way. The better way is there are a lot of visualizers on the internet that kind of define how a cubic Bezier function points can actually be made to work without actually specifying the points manually. You more visually try to pick what you want and then you can copy and paste the values in. One great example is actually Leah Veru created an amazing Cubic Bezier site that is really useful and that is cubicbezier.com. And what this place does is allows me to essentially compare and create my own easing curve without having to do too much to figure out what the mathematics behind it will be. Let's say I want something like this, something that's crazy like this. All I'm gonna do is just copy this, hit save, copy this value, and just replace it with my current cubic Bezier function that I have right here. Let me increase these values. Great, and if I go ahead and hit save, notice that now you'll see how B is actually moving. It is doing a strong bounce from one end to the other. It's pretty, pretty crazy. And I can also like pick other more sane ones if I really want to. Let me pick one that it's actually slows down, moves the circle back, and then moves it back to where it needs to be. And let me save this one and let's try what this looks like. I'm gonna go ahead and go back, close the dialog, hit save, hit save. 
and you'll see that this one goes back and then accelerates in, snaps back and snaps back in. With the custom Kubik Bezier values you specify, you can create eases that go well beyond the more, as you can now see, more conservative eases that you saw before. Even your craziest ease or ease in out won't compare to something that you can create that is custom and you specify to the Kubik Bezier function yourself. So I highly recommend you go ahead and visit a website like kubikbezier.com and go ahead and experiment with different ease values and create your own custom functions. There's some built-in ones if you really want to play with them if you want to, but really what's the fun in that? The most fun is really in moving these little, you know, various control points around and creating your own set of values for what will end up being probably your own very cool kind of an easing function. All right, so with that, we are done with your, our look at easing functions, well, how to read an easing function curve, and what the built-in easing functions actually do, ranging from the very boring linear to the very weird steps function to the really awesome and custom cubic Bezier one. So to learn more, just go to kubra.com and search for easing. If this video was very much focused on easing functions in terms of CSS. I wrote articles on how easing functions in JavaScript work using Robert Penner's easing equations. So if you're interested in JavaScript side of things, definitely go check it out. Just search for easing. You'll find this and many other articles right there. If you have any questions, post in the forums at forum.kurupa.com. You can also find me on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And of course, if you found this animation video really exciting, you'll definitely love my book, Animation in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You can find it in paperback and Kindle editions. All right, guys, I will catch you all next time.